Hello and welcome to Accelerate. I'm Matt Stone. This is the podcast where we encourage and inspire CEOs, founders, and visionaries on their big leap journeys. We talk about the stories and strategies that help you accelerate toward your big leap destination with purpose, humility, an open mind, commitment to growth, and recognition that the way we get there is at least as important as where we end up. And on today's episode, I am delighted to get to share an hour with Alicia Huck. She is the founder of Maverick and Company, which she founded, I believe, almost 20 years ago, maybe 18 years ago. She's a management consultant for executive teams and fast-growing companies. Alicia helps owners build strong leadership teams and processes so they can get back to building what matters. And in particular, she hones in on the strategies and solutions where growth or an impending leadership transition is highlighting the need to change. And change, change, change is constant. We all need change. So Alicia helps you do it much better, more strategically. She does have a background in sales and management with the Southwestern Company. She's done a lot more stuff. And very interestingly, uh, and I want to ask her about this right out of the gate, so here's a warning to you. Um, She's a mentor and member of the 100 Hours Club with Veterati, a, a very special organization that helps veterans as they transition to building careers and enterprises in the civilian world and the 100 hours club from what i understand means she's donated or mentored over a hundred hours for folks associated with veterati um welcome Alicia. you're not supposed to make people cry right off the bat you like <laughs> well i like to think of myself as the uh, barbara walters of the 21st century <laughs> Veterati is, um, so my friend Lita Citroen, who is literally, I think, in the 500 hour club, like, I mean, you just can't even hold a candle to her commitment and what she's done. And um, volunteering is really hard for me because I'm a crier. So like Uh, if I go to volunteer at a soup kitchen, I did some work here in Denver with one of our, um, a drop in day shelter for women and children called The Gathering Place. And they have a room there where if you are living on the street with your children, you can have somebody babysit your kids for an hour while you take a nap Wow! because you don't sleep if you live on the street. And I was like, I got to the nap room and I looked at my person who was giving me the tour and I was like, you have to get me out of this building right now. Like I can't. So like, I'm not a good on the front lines person and Veterati is this amazing, brilliant idea. And um, they match you up with veterans. It's insanely simple. All the scheduling Mm. happens automatically. And then you just do whatever it is you're good at in business. You just give that to a veteran or a spouse that's working on whatever they're working on. And they're, they're some of the most coachable, extraordinary calls that I do every single month. They're one of my all time favorite things. So the hundred hours just flies by because it's such a, it's such a good thing to do. And it's so insanely easy. Okay, so I just wanna say right now, I'm interested in this organization and I didn't know about it until I was reading more about you. So maybe after the show, you could help (laughs) connect me because I'm very interested in, uh, I was just last weekend speaking with someone who does volunteer work in Central Park for veterans. He works with disabled veterans. They help them fly fish. Mm, Yep. And of course there's all, you know, when I was a kid, I worked on a military base before I could legally work. My sister and I volunteered for the veterans hospital in Washington state on, uh, it was, uh, called, it was on American Lake. And I'm not kidding you. We bowled with the blind. They were mostly, um, Vietnam veterans at that yeah. time. And we would take blind veterans to the bowling lanes and they were absolutely a blast. I mean, an absolute, <laughs> I mean, can you imagine? And not bad bowlers either, by the way. They can tell you, the blind can tell you how many pins they knocked down. Mm-hmm. Well, it was it's super funny because um, because I've done so much and I'm a fan of the people that I meet and, you know, once you get into that community, so somebody posted something and they were like, so when I was in sniper school and I just replied and I said, my feed is a lot more interesting these days because that was stuff that didn't creep in before, but it's definitely there now. And just so your listeners know, Veterati is, um, it's www.veterati.com. And we can probably put that link up somewhere. Um, And you can literally create a profile that says who you are and who you think you can help. And what I've done is 
really say my calendar is open from here to here and it just makes it super easy and it all the scheduling is automatic the phone calls me at that time and puts us together and then um, if you choose to you can you know continue to throw resources people's way but you just I think the key is really say specifically what you're good at and what you can contribute and then the people who are looking for that help can make their way to you but I, I mean it's I know so many Marines and special forces people and you know all of it it's just so incredible and the spouses and the work that everybody's doing and you know we all like to talk about how yeah. patriotic we are and how much we love veterans and i think that's a really really simple easy great way to show it and to the veterans family i mean it's a whole family unit my mother worked with veteran with uh, mm -hmm. uh not veterans but uh active duty uh yeah. and their families in social work for years and years and years and it's a whole ecosystem mm -hmm. of people that uh, need yeah. support so help a veteran you're helping an entire community really and mm -hmm. um honoring those people who put their lives on the line for all of us so i love it i'm i'm gonna i'm absolutely i've been looking for this opportunity so we converted one i'm always promoting just, i'm like no we should all be doing this because it's <laughs> i don't even have to leave my cute little office I love right it. it's so simple i mean here i was just this is how it works if you put that intention out there, it just, the universe, I don't know how it works. It just f literally falls. And so you have mm -hmm. fallen out of heaven for me today. And I'm Aww. sure other folks too. So we'll definitely put the link up. Um, That's awesome. I love that. Thank you. And thank you for starting there. That's so, you're so classy. I can't even stand it. What can I say? You know, <laughs> it's the hair. It's the hair. Uh, listen, <laughs> Alicia, I mean, you and I hit it off the first time we talked for sure. Your energy is yeah. incredible. Maverick and Company. Um, mm -hmm. Did I get that right? 18 years ago? Is that about um, right? It was in 2004, I want to say. So wherever we are. Yeah, that's about right. It's, you just start, you just stop keeping track after a while. Cause when you first start, you're so desperate to like pay your bills and make it and whatever. And then you get, you know, the bigger you get, you're like, now I got all these other responsibilities, right? Mm -hmm. It's always a new part. That's partly what I think so many of us like about being an entrepreneur is it's just yeah. not boring. Like the, it's yeah. different every year. Like, you know, and then one year there's a global pandemic and you're like, Ooh, right. neat. Let's try to figure that out. Now here's another thing that we have in common that, um, just really brought me back to the day, okay? Because I think one of the greatest skills a, a leader can have is sales and door-to-door -door sales. Now, I did it with a with one of those painting franchises when I was in college. Oh, I went door-to-door-to-door -door -door selling selling um, paint jobs. Yeah, you intense. were going. It is, and I don't know that you could. I mean, does anyone do door-to-door -door anymore? It's too scary. Uh, no. They still right? do. So the program that I worked with is called the Southwestern Advantage Program now. Yeah. It's been around for like 175 years, something crazy. Wow. They are still, they are out there right now selling books door to door. They sold all the way through the pandemic. They came up with all these procedures. They made sure it was safe. Like it's, I mean, it's bonkers. In fact, this morning I was on wow. a call with a bunch of alumni and it, it's just I mean, you know, right? Because you did it. The the maturity that it helps you develop, the way it, that was the first time anybody had ever talked to me about self-talk. Right. Right. Like, I, you know, sales was the first right. place that the idea that you should think about how you think and work to actively influence how you speak to yourself. I mean, that is a really powerful idea that doesn't necessarily get all over everybody. I mean, maybe now more yeah. so with, you know, our guru culture, but back when I started, that was a new idea for me. So yeah, yeah that totally. was, and I was yeah. just on the phone with some of those guys today. And it's, uh, you know, now as business owners, we get together and we we're talking about how you promote, how you create a high performing culture, but it's such a great, if you've done that kind of selling, what it teaches you about you and the muscles that it has you build are just, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it doesn't get you a ticket to any job you ever want, but when you find the job you want, it really accelerates. Ha ha. See that circle back. Uh -huh. um. I see what you did there. <laughs> She's a tricky one, folks. Crafty. Crafty. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I love how you put that. It won't necessarily, because it doesn't always get the respect that it deserves, but, but when you're yeah. in the job, like the amount of, of trust building that you do at an accelerated rate in a door to door sale. It, I mean, yeah, well, and I don't, I will tell you, Matt, I don't even think for me, 
when I was doing it, I thought it was the sales. And that's part of why I did it, right? Learn all those things that you're going to learn. It was actually the four years that I spent recruiting, training, and managing yeah. other students. Because when you're 19 years old, nobody yeah. should put you in charge of that. That is a terrible, you are not skilled. You think you're all fire, you know, shabam, shabam. It, it's just, um, you know, what you say to somebody when they've just had a really epically terrible week, it's not going well, right? How do you help somebody find the right. part of themselves that actually wants to keep going, right? And what do you do with an organization? I mean, the thing I loved most about those summers in retrospect is that they're like the fruit flies of the business world. Like in, mm. in research, in medical research, you use fruit flies because they have a short life cycle. Right. So you right. can see lots of generations. And similarly, what we did to train people going to the field in the, in, in the spring and then into the summer, we knew right away whether or not it worked. Like you get a week in and you know whether or not you were effective. And when you have a meeting with somebody on a Sunday, you just need the stats to roll in Monday night to know whether or not that meeting worked. And so yeah. you get you get more feedback. The, the, feedback the failure loop. loops, the feedback mm -hmm. loop is much tighter. And for me, I mean, I, I added it up one time and I did 30,000 cold calls before I was 30. Wow. Which is, and That's by the mind way, blowing. they just make me cry. Like once I stopped, I was like, I will never, as long as I, like, I, it was so hard for me emotionally. And yeah. so it's, nice to not be doing that anymore but i'm glad i did it but you it, was know? A, it was a huge learning experience yeah yeah and you just learn how to have the kind of conversations that make a difference with teams right yeah. and and how to listen for the thing that's going to move the needle for folks and you just get to get so much of your dumb stuff over with as a leader mm. while you're still young and there's not i mean it feels like everything's at stake but you know there's I talk to people now, it's funny, I was joking with somebody, I go, $100 million, not that I have it, right? But it has stopped feeling like a big number. Because uh, there's right. so many businesses that that's just par for the, you know, it's just 100 million, it's just not that much. And when right. we have conversations about venture capital or private equity, it just, you know, I would yeah. like for that to be my personal number and have it not feel like a lot, but we're a little ways away from that. We're working on that, <laughs> yeah. Next year, 2023. You know, goals. It could happen. I mean, let's face it. Um, <laughs> so I always like to know um, what what was that moment that you knew you were going to make the leap to Maverick? And, and was it, did you go straight to Maverick or did, was there a different name in it initially or was it always Maverick at the beginning? Oh my God. This is a good, I don't what, know if what it's was a good the moment? story. Well, um, you know, we'll edit it out if it's not. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I love that. Um, well, I had sold books in college and done really well, gone into a corporate sales job and not done really well, got fired, right? I'm one of those, it's like been fired from multiple things because it's just so bad. And um, and I just wasn't sure what, I, what it is I wanted to do. So I worked with a company that did um, experiential learning workshops with high school kids and I got fired from that. Like I did well and then, you know... I, I wanted a seat at the table, right? I'm ornery and I'd had all these years of working in a sales group where I was one of the leaders. Like when you help build a massive sales organization and you are running it at an early age, you don't wanna go backwards after that. And so um, I took a little break. I was uh, managing a friend of mine's law firm part-time. <laughs> I built all this stuff in that law firm systems and processes that they still use to this day, like these little pink sheets and the folders and the whole, you know, cause I'm a big systems nerd. And I just remember I had gone on a vacation to um, California. I did this class and they were all talking about, you know, this, that old saying used to be, what would you do if you knew you couldn't fail? And there was some leader or, or something that I heard. And it was, what would you do if you knew you could fail? Mm. Like, what if it was okay to fail? What if it was okay to not have it go well, right? And something about that, for me, I was like, if I don't let go of this other thing, I will never make the product. Like, I just, I can't do both because my safety net doesn't work, right? Mm -hmm. So I came back, I let go of my safety net. It was the most epically stupid thing you could possibly, like it's the worst possible way to start a business. I had no experience. I had no money in the bank. I had no connections. I'd been doing door-to-door -door sales, which I was never going to do again. And so I had no idea how to like build a network and work, you know, like that. I remember calling a friend of mine and being like, so how do you, where, how do you put together like a contract? Do you have one I could like 
borrow, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, we're all these little stupid things. But for me, luckily, I didn't have a family. I didn't have, you know, all my responsibilities were basically me. And it, it made it possible to be really broke for a long time and, you know, do a whole bunch of iterations. Like people kept telling me to do sales training. I was like, I don't want to do sales training. Didn't you hear that? I don't like sales. Right. Yeah. I don't want to spend my life teaching people how to get past secretaries. That doesn't feel right. But it, so it was a long windy kind of journey. But um, I, I think when I look back all the times that I tried to veer off course and go to work for somebody else or try something different, it just, you know, life kept being like, nope, this is where you belong. Sort it out, sort it out, sort it right. out, which wasn't fun at the time. But, you know, once you find your stride and you can put your effort toward not just surviving, but like making progress and really building something. And I, I think I would say too, it's just really inspiring to have a front row seat. At, I mean, you know, you're a coach, right? It's really inspiring to have a front row seat at some of people's best and worst moments to see them make those changes and have those ahas, those epiphanies where they go, oh, I don't have to do it this way. I could actually get what I want. Because mm -hmm. especially I think when you work with entrepreneurs and leaders, um, they're all in, right? Like this is not right. some casual exercise for them. This is a thing they fought for. And, and if you're a leader with any kind of effectiveness, you're tied to your people and it's painful when they're not winning and you're not winning. And, and so having a front row seat for that, I just got back from a trip and, you know, it was an intense trip because it's an intense group that I go to meet with and okay. um, in all the best ways. But I came home and, you know, one of the team members had had kind of gotten off track and gotten into a conflict and da 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 and then sent an email and I was reading it in the Denver airport at like 930 at night on a Wednesday and I almost started crying at baggage, like walking through the baggage to get out because it was so... Mm this person just was so responsible for their part in what had gotten off the rails and was so humble and grateful about, Hey, thanks for calling me on that. And I mean, it's just wow. not the world most people are operating in, right? right. It's not, that's right. not how every day goes. So. Wow. Yeah. I was going to say, if you're crying in baggage handling, you're, you're not alone. They just don't know why you're crying. You know, they just assume. Well, partly I was reason. crying because I was in baggage handling, right? Like, exactly. people, like People used to say to me, do you travel a lot? And I would be like, I don't really know how to answer that. And I'm like, I do now. The answer is I never yeah. use baggage. Like I'm, I always do carry on. And so avoid, some, avoid. Mm. Oh my God. It just was, I was like, what am I doing here? This is seven minutes I need. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, there is. There are a few things more rewarding than the humility that people in leadership are capable of demonstrating um, when they are treated in a certain way, when they are put in a position to where um, they are seen and respected, even if they've made mistakes. Well, who hasn't, right? And I, I mean, I just had this happen with another leader that uh, I've been working with the, this team because we work with teams, uh, as you do. Um, yeah. And one of the key players in this team, the level of humility, and he had, does it in his own way. It's not, mm -hmm. you have to listen to <laughs> what they mean, not what they're saying, you know, right. giving people credit for the way they communicate that they yeah. care, yes. <laughs> which isn't yes. going to be, it's not going to be the way you and I necessarily do it, but it's there. Yeah. And it's just that is there are a few things more rewarding than that because you can see what that's going to mean for them and for everyone they encounter um, yeah. moving forward and how that the team itself is just going to blossom from that. So and just the, the courage, yeah. right? The yes. courage that people show yes. and the generosity. Right. I mean, I met uh, this is a really extreme example, but um, I used to get called into schools. And, you know, if they were having a change in leadership, um, teachers mm -hmm. are can be really intense human beings. And when they decide they don't like something, they really can fight very hard. And the school, for a whole bunch of reasons, had just had massive problems. And the person who brought me in, um, she never, ever told anybody this, except I think me. Um, mm -hmm. She had gotten, she happened to be African-American. She had gotten some of the ugliest, nastiest, most racist crap dumped on her front lawn. Like they did horrible things in this mm -hmm. community against this person. 
and she was having all this conflict because she was just brought in improperly, right? So we did a big reset. We got everybody on the same page and, you know, magically a lot of the conflict dissipates when you actually call attention to it, name it the right thing, give people a chance. Nobody wants it to be that way. But I, I have, to this day, I am still awed because that would have been a really easy card for her to pull and say, see, this is what's happening. Now you have to get on board. And the fact that she was so adamant that she would never, I still don't think anybody in that entire group knew. Um, it's that kind of stuff, right? Like wow. heavy is the head that wears the crown. If you're really doing it wow. right, you're carrying a lot of stuff. And I think, I mean, I'm sure it's the same way for you. A lot of the people that I work with, um, you can't take all those conversations downward in your organization. The difference mm -hmm. it makes to have somebody on the outside that you who gets it and who really, really gets it is a big deal because it is a lot of weight to carry around when you take it seriously, which, yeah. you know, the great ones do. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Ditto. I mean, I... I... <laughs> I'm not going to waste a whole bunch of time just repeating what you just said in a less articulate way, but I'll just say 100% true. I think that's why we connected, right? Because we're yeah. both like, I mean, to because we have um, an awe and a reverence and an appreciation for what people, what those leaders actually experience. And I, I mean, if you, if I don't know, one of you asked me to think about some of the things that kind of grind my, my cheese. And one of them is Absolutely. people who, who don't have that kind of appreciation for what it's really like to be the owner, the leader, or the people at the, t because um, it's really easy to a throw stones, right? You got to do all this stuff better. You're not doing it the right way. You should do it this way, not that way. And B to just be really arrogant. Like I know I'm like, you don't know. I don't, how can I possibly know? I can empathize. I can project. I am an, I am a world-class Olympic gold star guesser because of the experiences I've had and the people that I've had a chance to work with, but like, you mm. don't know. And the, the arrogance that some people sell based on, right. Because then people who are buying that are like grasping for that kind of strength or that kind of um, certainty. It's usually not real. I don't, I don't think it can be. So I'm really glad that you pivoted into the grind my gear, which is kind of how we we had agreed to like, I was like, oh, we were yeah. sharing some gripes before privately. And I was like, okay, that's a podcast. And so enough of all of this love and hippy dippy stuff. Yeah, um, let's talk about stuff that sucks and people we hate. Effed up Friday. So what are the <laughs> effed up things that you see out there that... Um, that are working counter to us doing better as leaders and teams and things like yeah. that. What are some of the things that you're running across either from oh the practitioner gosh. side, the marketing yeah. side, and then the, the leader side. Uh, brutal in every respect. Well, I will say the number one thing, and this is sort of my, I mean, you can tell with a name like Maverick and company, right? I think one of the most heartbreaking things in life is that we oftentimes think that we have to be somebody that we're not in order to have the things that we want. And most of us tend to undervalue who we are, like the natural gifts that we bring, right? So I just did some, uh, we found it just a really simple little uh, skills test, right? We did the Clifton thing and, and I was laughing with all the members of the team that was doing it. And I said, when people do this kind of thing, they usually have one of two responses. They either get really upset about the quality they think they have, they should have, that it doesn't show up on the test. Like, I no, I'm this, I'm really this, I have this thing, right? Mm -hmm. And they just fail to appreciate the stuff that they actually do have, right? Because we, the stuff that comes easily and naturally to you, which is usually your greatest strength, your best skill sets, um, you kind of tend to think that everybody else has that. Right. And you, you don't, you know, other people do not have that. I mean, one of the women that is on my team, she was laughing. She said, yeah, at my last job, my boss was always yelling at me about strategy and strategy, 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 strategy. And she is, when you look at her stuff, she is a relator. She is this magical relationship builder, and she really has a great feel for just in the field, what are the assets we want to pluck out? And she gets things done through people, not right. through strategy. So her right. boss was always yelling at her to be more strategic, and she just said, man, I, I like being in a place where it's actually appreciated that this is how I win the game. And I'm like, are you kidding? That's why I hired you. That's the number one reason you're here. So for me, it's the heartbreak around and I think part of it is we have a lot of people who are invested in selling you their way. 
So they want to make your way wrong or insufficient or incomplete, right. not, not maliciously a lot of the time. Right. But I am of the opinion, and after all the years and the hundreds of people I've worked with, that most of the time you're going to get farther by actually studying your own little book of success. What is it about you that has you do better? And we mm. should do a little less telling people, no, you got to be more this or less of that or blah, blah, and go, well, how do you win? Right. Mm. If you, I, I met an attorney once she had, she just had a messy desk. She was in-house counsel for a big company and, you know, she's just a messy desk person. And she said, well, I should really get better at my desk. I should get, you know, I should, this is the year. I, and I, I looked at her, I go, what would you do if I told you, you never, I said, does it get in the way for you of producing results? And she's like, oh no, not at all. I go, what would you do? How would it feel if I told you, you never, ever, ever again, for as long as you live, have to think about cleaning that desk and no one will know, and no one will judge you and no one will care. You just, if you want it clean, you clean it. If you don't care that it's not clean, you don't clean it. And she like almost burst into tears. She's been making herself wrong for two decades about her stupid desk. Who can't, like, why are we, you know, I honestly, maybe, maybe we should all be blaming Stephen Covey, right? Like it's, everybody <laughs> has the four quadrants and you have to schedule every minute of every day. And if that works for you, great, but I'm not a schedule every minute of every day kind of girl. That's not going to work for me. So why would I be killing myself to make that happen? Reminds me of getting things done. It's kind of like, um, you know, it can be very powerful. It can, it can be there. Are, you know, it can be useful, but engineers it, with book deals are dangerous human beings, right? <laughs> I love them, but my God. <laughs> yeah. No, I think that is one thing that we're, we're learning how to honor difference a, a little bit differently these days. And um, it's still a work in progress, but you know, realizing, but don't tell my wife anything about that whole, you can leave things messy. <laughs> Thing. Okay, I just want to be clear on that. I don't think she's paying attention to the podcast right now, but if she does, I may have to uh, distract her around this this point in the conversation. Well, and it's tough, right? Because you can't be air you. Um, I heard it this way. So James Earl Jones came to my little university. I went to the University of South Dakota, and um, he came to talk about diversity. And let's just be really honest and say that diversity is not really a thing. In, like most South, in Dakotans South Dakota, yeah, are white German Catholic, including right. the Lutherans. Right? It's a pretty. If right. You get off the plane with blonde hair and blue eyes. You're probably related to one of us. Is how yeah, I right? think about it. Yeah. And we do have, I mean, a strong Native population that we tend to disregard. And at my university, you know, we had some exchange students and some student athletes, but we were pretty looking one way kind of group. But he was talking about racism and he said that Martin Luther King used to talk about racism and say that the problem with racism in this country is that we relate to it. Like if your end of the boat is on fire, it's not my problem. But mm. the truth is we're all in the same boat. So if your end of the boat is on fire, my boat is also on fire. And that means I don't just have an, a right to speak up and say, hey, guys, stop setting fire to the boat. I have an obligation. Obligation. Mm -hmm. We should all be interested in that. Right. right. So I think one of the tough things in organizations is we kind of bastardize the concept of teamwork to mean Matt's a schmuck and doesn't do his job, but I am a quote team player. So I will now pick up the slack for him. Right. Right. And instead what it should be is we're all on the same boat and the boat is what gets us there. So what kind of boat do we need to design that lets the, the vast majority of us have our best shot at success? Yeah. And if we thought about it that way, then we could find that middle ground between you don't you have different rules for how much of a mess is actually a mess than your wife. Right. Or at work, what actually <laughs> works. But I just you know, I want people to know how how they win the game and yeah. focus on winning that way, because the, the, the research is clear. It's just that's where your opportunities are. You yeah. can't maximize what you suck at. You can yeah. maximize what you're good at. Well, actually, so this this is one thing that grinds my gears that's related Ooh, to what you said. Um, <laughs> I think the over assumptions around the meanings of words. So we, we throw mm. around these words like empathy, and then they become mm. a thing. Yeah. And then it's like empathy, empathy, empathy. And, no, and the, I don't see a whole lot of quality discussion around what empathy is, how dangerous it can be, how draining it can be the boundaries you need to have a healthy relationship with empathy, how you 
how you have to earn your way to empathize with someone. If they don't accept your empathy, what good is it? I mean, there's all of this stuff around it that it just becomes another term that, you know, and, and maybe bastardized. that's, it gets bastardized. Actually, that's the exact, that's the exact right thing. And so, okay. So now the word strategy in the example that you gave before, what kept coming up for me with that leader was you need to be more strategic. And I'm thinking she's highly strategic. You have to be very strategic to get up to herd cats in a way that they mm-hmm. want to go where you need them to go in order to get the right thing. I mean, t- mm-hmm. to work with people that way. Yes. That's a next level of strategy. Cause that's Jedi. <laughs> that's that Je- is Jedi. That's, that's Jedi funny. shit. That's that that I'm is dying. Jedi level shit. I mean, that yeah. really. So, so instead of, but we get, so, and look, I'm, I've been there too. But like there are some leaders that I meet that are so bought into their system, whatever it was, if they did Six Sigma, if they yes. did. And th- th- again, there's value in all of it, sure. but it can't be used then. It, it gets used as a shield or a sword. Same thing with personality profiles. Grinds my gears. Oh, I took a profile. Now this is who I am. And now I'm going to walk around. It isn't who you are. Yeah. And therefore I can't interact with you because you're blue and I'm purple and we don't get along. So it's an off the hook as opposed to an opening for a conversation. Yeah. Yeah. And they're busy wailing on each other. One of the Myers Briggs Myers Briggs books that I read years ago was please understand me. And back then, okay, so I read it and I did my profile or whatever. And now I look at that and I go, what a horrible thing to say. Please understand me. I mean, it's like well, I mean, I want to be understood. We all do. But, you know, we're dynamic. We're so dynamic. Each relationship is unique. So I can know my type according to this particular test. And there is value in, in yes. what, you know, internal self-awareness, definitely in that. When it comes to relating with other people, however, if you stop there, you are dead. Because yeah. labeling you as an INTJ, that I, I heard you're an INTJ, and then reading what an INTJ is and figuring that I've got Alicia right. pegged. Right. No, no, no. By, by the way, sidebar, if anybody ever asks you what you are in a type and you don't want to tell them, the answer I just give <laughs> is they say, well, what's your Myers-Briggs? I go, I think I took that. It came back. Uh, let me think. Awesome, awesome, more awesome, super awesome. <laughs> oh, my God. I've been waiting for that solution for years. <laughs> right. You can steal that. You got to come up with one for disc too. You, yeah. Same one. Same one. Just awesome. There's four, yeah. right? There's awesome, awesome, yeah. more awesome. I think and it's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and Supremely to awesome. me, it's a little bit like, um, you know, people will say, well, I have an open door policy. And I'm like, that's adorable. Right. And I almost wish people would stop having them because they make you feel like you've done something. Right. And I just had this conversation with somebody. I'm like, it, it, it's not the open door, right? And they're like, well, well, they could come to me. And I'm like, yeah, you think so. Because you have a higher tolerance for chaos and conflict. But right. you have spent years teaching them that they, in fact, cannot come to you. That it is not a safe exercise to bring you contradictory information. It was funny. I just this morning um, was rereading <laughs> so well um, Creativity Inc., which ah, is the book mm. about Pixar and is really brilliant. Boy, that's an engineer that did something with their engineering abilities. Yeah. And they were talking about what you have to put in place in order to have people give give each other feedback and be able to do that in a supportive way. And um, the Netflix book, No Rules Rules, has a bunch of stuff. And they really talk about candor versus honesty and giving feedback that is actionable and practical right because i do worry sometimes you know you set people off on like well we're going to tell the truth kind of mission and i'm giving you feedback and it's you know brutal honesty is brutality oh my god right (laughs) and especially if it's like this vague crap like you just need to speak up more at meetings you're not inspirational at all whatever that means oh my god yeah. yeah, you need to be you need to be nice or too more aggressive. Um, I don't have time to babysit people's feelings. I don't think that's going to work for me. Right. So I just think it's a really it's a lost art. form. Don't get me started on competencies. Okay. <laughs> don't, 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 don't don't my microphone might break. I'm going to need a new one. Um, Matt bursts into flames. Oh, my God. I just yeah, I know we have to scale things so they can be sent out to 10,000 people, but. Yeah. So let's, 
Mm. Not forgetting that you got to be, you, you never get a hall pass for being awake and intentional. Like it's going right. to keep changing. It's going to keep moving. You got to keep re-engaging. It's a mistake to think that it's handled. If you think it's handled, you're screwed. You're screwed. If you, if you think it might be like, okay, for the minute, you, you probably, that might be a reasonable assessment. Yeah. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm a little distracted at the moment, I'll just admit, um, because I'm trying to get, I closed out this window that had some really good stuff on it. And it was from your, you put, and I encourage anyone who, if you're digging Alicia as I do, go find her. I know. I mean, her Myers-Briggs type indicators are awesome, awesome. (laughs) I mean, more you know, awesome it's super super awesome the se- the 17th type <laughs> the, the, <laughs> the, the one the one you didn't hear about um but i just really like in your about section um you have a, a section here it's five bullet points and i thought we could go over them real quick because i think they're yeah. really good signs that your leadership team needs help can we just yeah. go over each one of them and have you talk a little bit about you know how you yeah. come to that so the first and- one is oh go ahead Oh, and I'll just preface that by saying that my specialty is really working with executive teams in fast growing companies. And a lot of them don't know how to scale a business or they're scaling, but they have some places where they really get it and some places where they don't. So like Mm -hmm. they get big and then you just see this cascading series of problems. So over the years, as I've looked, there's a pattern that gets established. and, And I think the thing that's key is that these are the problems that pop up that you think you should attack this problem, right? But it's not that. The thing underneath it is what yeah. is really going to bear fruit. And so these are the warning signs. But, you know, I saw an episode of Big Bang Theory where Penny, the character, had gotten a check engine light. So she put a duct tape, piece of duct tape over the light. <laughs> what right? a great solution. Yeah. Yes. Just, just sort of like, let's just get more organized. That'll have us no be evil, more efficient. See yeah. no evil, speak no evil. <laughs> And it's also to the credit of leaders. I mean, you know, they're they're so any of us when you're close to something and you're in it, you just need help to get perspective. You can't no matter how smart you are. I mean, the stuff that I come up with when I've got my coach asking me the question and it just, it's like, "Oh, mm-hmm. why didn't I do that 6 years ago?" It's it, yeah. but it's just the way it is. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So the first one, can I read these? Yeah, go for it. First one. Yeah. You're in too many meetings and don't have enough time to do your actual job. Yeah. Too many. How do you know you're in too many meetings? You have the thought. I feel like I'm in too many meetings. Literally, right? (laughs) Yeah. Like, listen, meetings are great, right? If you do them well, they're a flipping miracle, right? A great meeting should leave you energized. It should give you a bunch of extra clarity. But I, the the place where meetings usually go off the rails, it's not a meetings problem, it's a data problem. Because when you're small and you've got just a group of folks, all we have to do to figure out what's going on is mm-hmm. look around and go, hey guys, what's going on? And we talk mm-hmm. and then we say, hey guys, what should we do about what's going on? And we make a decision. And then we, we're all on the same page automatically because the room was the room, right? You get big and now I've got people in different groups who aren't in every meeting. And I've got maybe people on different floors or I've got people in different cities. And we used to gather that information by just bumping into each other, but now we feel like we've got to go get it, right? Mm -hmm. If we don't build a way to go get it efficiently, then we spend all our time just running around trying to figure out what's going on. Mm-hmm. And the second thing that we do wrong is we think we have to manage things by knowing a hundred percent of the data. So when we're young, right, everybody, it's like, every, it's like you're running a small airport and you've got five planes and five pilots. And every day you show up and you go, okay, let's fly some stuff and some people somewhere and we all go do our <laughs> thing. Right. As you get bigger though, you can't keep track of it that way. Now we got 50 planes and 50 pilots and we got to have an air traffic control group whose only job is to make sure nobody's running into anybody. So I worked with an engineering firm once and I I loved these people. They had about 70 open projects at any given time. And I said, okay, well, how do you keep track of them? How do you know what's going on in each one? And they said, well, one of the five members of the management team will open up the project and like review it. That's insane. But if you've grown up managing by touch, you don't know a different way. Right. 
So what we did is we said, no, 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 the person on the front line needs 100% of the data. They should know everything that's going on. And we should pick maybe 10% of that to have them report up so that mm -hmm. the person that manages them can look. And that 10% is a little bit like that check engine light. It should give you just enough information to tell you what you need to pay more attention to. Right. right. And then you go one level higher and you get to a 1% at the very top. And we use, because I use, red, yellow, green. Like, just give me a big list with 70 projects and let's rank them. They're either red, meaning they're on fire, actively in flames, all hands on deck, we need help. They're yellow, which means we're in trouble. We might be about to miss something, but we haven't missed it yet. We think right. we might be able to get back on track. And green means we're good. We're sailing, so yeah. You take a meeting where in the past, I was trying to give you a verbal update on 70 different projects and get everybody on the same page while we problem solve at the same time and flip it to a meeting where, show me the list. We got 70 projects, we got 15 that are red, let's start there. Now yeah. we've, we've shrunk the amount of time, right? So when you think you're in too many meetings, it's usually data and how we're organizing that data that's, that's causing the problem. So you yeah. can read all the books you want on how to have a better meeting and you can write up agendas, which I don't love. And you can spend all this time doing all that crap or do standing meetings. None of it makes a difference if you don't get to the infrastructure problem underneath it. Yeah, that's a really astute point. Um, I know. Awesome. Awesome. More yeah. awesome. <laughs> which 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 letter does that come from? Is it the awesome uh, or the more awesome? No, I, I didn't read it that closely. <laughs> you're gonna have to go back and read the type. Okay, here's this, here's the next one, uh, real quick. So you're inefficient. It sometimes takes forever to get good work out the door. Yeah. So if you've got anything that you're producing for people and you just it just doesn't seem to move, right? And as yeah. you add complexity, things get harder. That's a signal that you're you're not managing things in the appropriate way, right? Because yeah. you don't you don't have a process, and usually it's um, a breakdown in how you've got one person managing another, how you have things reporting, and how you're doing your deadlines. And yeah. I, I would argue a lot of times it's, you're just not actively managing the thing. You've got too many people involved. You don't have a clear process, right. and it just grinds to a halt. Now, with your clients, how often do you see a situation where what worked for them before, it, the situation has changed, the personnel have changed, the mission's changed, and now what worked for them before, it, it, they're still doing something that used to work but doesn't work that well now? Uh, that's 99% of the people that I work with, right? We, yeah. we say that bigger is different, right? Like you can't understand traffic by understanding cars. You have to look at the whole pattern. The whole pattern, yeah. And just like any, you know, if, if you feed four people for dinner every night, it's you and your spouse and a couple of kids. Um, that's one thing. If I have you feeding 400 people every night, now it all breaks. Right. And we don't, we don't have good capacity for that. We don't always think right. about that. So the transition from small to big is the equivalent of, we used to play baseball and we're really good baseball players, but now we play football and nobody told us. Yep. And now you're going to get hit and you're going to, if you show up to a football game thinking you're still playing baseball, like that's how big the difference is, right? <laughs> Concussion <that's>, city. <laughs> if you <laughs> feel like you're getting creamed every day, that's yeah. actually why, because that growth, that expansion of size, yeah. it causes this cascading series of breakdowns. And if you, do, it's a little bit, the other analogy I use a lot is, um, you know, if you get a half an inch of snow in, South, in like Denver, Colorado, mm. it's fine. Yeah. If you get a half an inch in Atlanta, Georgia, you could shut down the whole city. And the problem isn't the snow. No, it's the infrastructure. It's the systems. It's all of that. Yeah. You don't have trucks. You don't have no. salt. You don't have pilots. You don't have plows. That's the thing that's missing. It's exactly the same in a business. Yeah. It's not that you got big. It's that you don't have all this stuff to efficiently move data. You don't have a good way to make decisions anymore, right? So yeah. that's another thing that means you get more inefficient because you're waiting to talk to everybody or leaving out the two people that you really needed. It's either moving too fast or too slow. It all means it gets later and later for the customer. I guess what's coming up for me as you're sharing all this wisdom, though, is, is to let people know if you're a leader in that situation, it's okay. Like... It isn't that you're bad at your job. Yes. Admitting that you're drowning doesn't mean you are a bad leader. Doesn't mean you don't you're not good at it. Um, it just means you need more help because you're going somewhere new. 
and Listen, you're gonna learn more. The job has changed. Yeah, it's you changed. You play football now, and you <laughs> both have to learn how to play it and coach up a whole team. Yeah. And what I say to people, there's just for me the 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 classic sign that you want to call somebody like me, and there's not that many of us that really do this kind of work, um, yeah. is you can't work hard enough to get out of the hole. You can't hire enough people. You, no matter right. how much money you spend, no matter how hard you work, you just can't get it to change mm -hmm. because you think you can work your way out of it. And then you'll try to hire your way out of it, right? You'll right. spend your way out of it on, you know, fancier project management software. Right. It's these kinds of problems when you get big, like we actually call bigger, that is its own unique state. It's like when you go from, you know, water to ice or water to steam. Mm -hmm. It's a state change. It's a whole different ball game, yes. right? We're now playing football and the rules are completely different and nobody tells you. Right. So all of a sudden you're just playing football and you're right. like, I don't understand why we can't get stuff out the door. We keep hiring more people and yeah. it seems like it just slows it all down. So right. you're exactly right. They should definitely know you are not alone and you're not stupid. Your, your business might look the same and the logos there and the door and what it's a whole different ball game. Yeah. And you you might need some clues. <laughs> we can yeah, sneak look, you the cliff look notes for these on how to do that. <laughs> look for these <laughs> symptoms. And if you're feeling this, it's okay. You can come discreetly admit that. And Alicia's going to help you uh, figure out how to reinvent yourself yeah. again. And it's all born of that you did a whole bunch of stuff right. You exactly. You worked really hard. I think it that got was the, big. Thank and you. And you can't just shrink it. Like that's Thank the you. other problem. You keep like, what are your options? And some businesses <laughs> will just end up failing enough, right? Yeah. You'll lose some good people, you shrink, but that's a very painful thing because you've already got these people on payroll. You invested all this time and money in that growth. You bought mm -hmm. all the computers, you're in two floors. It can get really ugly really fast. You know, I keep seeing these um, advertisements online for building the business of your dreams and working two days a week and spending the rest of the time on the on the beach uh are you telling me that that is not true uh i can't believe it. what i don't understand is why are they always the cheapest signs you've ever seen in your life uh, like if you're making this much money can't you afford a real sign i mean i don't want to be skeptical i'm just a consultant yeah who am i to say yeah no there's a lot of that okay let's go to the next one here um, <laughs> um inconsistent quality is causing customer problems that's yeah the so quality issues go right along with inefficiency it's um you probably have never defined your standards you haven't defined the process by which you produce the quality that happens a lot when you've been relying on personalities like any place right. in your business, somebody that you're afraid to lose because they know so much about how you do it or their system, like you have to get all that knowledge out of somebody's head and make it duplicatable. Yeah. And yeah. if, by the way, you've got, you know, um, a salesperson that you just can't lose, you should be very careful. Like any, every time in an organization, somebody says to me, we just can't afford to lose so-and-so. And then a year later, that person's been fired. They've moved on. They, whatever, they, whatever, we uncovered bad stuff. You, what we always find is a, you can definitely live without them. Yeah. And B, um, they, there are bad things. There are creepy crawly things underneath that rock. And when you discover them, you will be even more glad that that person is gone. Yep. Every Absolutely. single time. And so often those are the people who are, yeah, they're, they're, they've got the often, not always the ego issues, the, uh, keeping other people down to keep themselves elevated. I mean, it can create such a toxic performance culture. Um, this morning I was asked, well, what's your clue that, you know, what's your hint that you would give people, um, about creating a high performance culture. And I said, fire people. Yeah. Like, here's the thing, a lot of people, and I know a lot of owners are really worried right now, right? There's good people you want to keep. Here's the thing. Sure. Most of the people who are leaving are not leaving just because you can't pay them as much or blah, blah, blah. They're leaving because there's a coworker who has an attitude problem, an effort problem, or a results problem, and nothing's being done about it. Or they have a manager that is the problem and nothing is being done about that. So do a hard audit, right? Some of your people are just difficult. And my, my, my gauge is always attitude, effort, and results. Mm -hmm. You can have a bad day. You can be going through a divorce and maybe your attitude slips. You can always be giving me two out of the three. 
yep. should be doing three out of three. But if you have a bad day, bad week, whatever, that's fine. But if you take a good hard look at your people and ask yourself, if they quit tomorrow, would you be relieved or sad? Mm. And when you look and you go, I'd actually be kind of relieved because your low performers take up so much of your time and energy. And you've got to remember as an owner, this is, this is one of my big things I teach people. However bad they are in front of you, they are 10 times ten worse times when you're worse. not in the room. And that's a conservative Thank estimate. Thank you. Yeah, it's Lord of the Flies out there, and you might be able to tolerate their bad attitude. You just have no idea the kind of stuff that they say and do when you're not in the room. That's because it. Because you're at the top of the power hierarchy. So mm -hmm. it's get rid of your bad people, hold them accountable, move them on. That alone would solve a ton of human problems and retention issues and loyalty issues. You can't pay people. That's fine, but I can make sure you don't work with jerks while we grow this business together and then earn the rewards. A lot of people will stick around for that if they see the progress. A lot of good people. People want to see growth. One of the most demotivating things ever is I, I don't see how I'm gonna grow in this job. And frankly, having coworkers like that where the business isn't handling them, um, to your point, I think, is one of the biggest indicators that I can't grow because look at the, I mean, first of all, growth isn't rewarded around here mm -hmm. and, um, and they don't fix problem. So I should go somewhere where they do and where I can grow and thrive. Well, why wouldn't you, to your point, I love that. Why wouldn't you be in a conversation with your people about where their learning edge is, yeah, right? Hey, that's it. this quarter, here's what I'm focused on. Right. Here's the book that I'm reading. Here's the class that I'm taking, the TED talk I'm listening to. Right. Don't I want to know what your growth edge is? We know that human beings need to change and develop new skills over time. We know that that gives you a confidence boost. We know it makes you more effective. So, you know, I, sometimes I laugh with groups. I'm like, listen, books are cheap and it's not the only way, but why wouldn't you have a library in your business? Yeah. Like, if, oh, people might keep the books. Great. <laughs> Great. That's the best problem in <laughs> right. the universe, right? right? I mean, <laughs> buy them what? some, oh, they don't read. They, lead, they listen to audio. Well, buy some audio books. Like, what are what? I mean, it's everybody gets audible. No, it's true. Uh, Blinkist, any of these things, you know, um, are, can be great, great benefits for sure. Yeah, yeah. Have them read it and have them talk. By the way, side note: um, there's a book called Loon Shots by Safi Bacall, oh. and I I talked to my friend of mine about it, and she has a book club with her salespeople. Right? She's respond. She's about a uh, half a billion dollar quota with her team. So she's All doing right. some stuff, right? Doing a few and, things. Uh, yeah. And I had connected with Safi Bacall a little bit on LinkedIn. And so I randomly left him a note and said, hey, they're going to read your book and I'm going to be, you know, you want to join us? And he came. No way. He hung out for like 45 minutes. It was the craziest, it's most amazing. generous, but stuff like that, right? Because they have a book club. They talk about things and they encourage their people to bring in that good stuff. There's one of the things people forget in the conversation about money. And listen, some of this is game changing money. If somebody else can offer me a hundred thousand dollars more than you, or even 50 or 25 and a better bonus, you know, better health insurance, maybe that's worth it for me to move. Right. But a lot of people, that's not the only number in the equation. And if you mm -hmm. give me a great group of human beings to work with, a group that I can learn and grow with. I mean, I always tell people, I'm like, listen, think about how many billions of hours human beings donate to volunteering. Yep. We we're just talking about it, right? For yep. free, where nobody yes. pays me at all, where sometimes I got to pay money of my own to make that happen. Right. We care about that. And think about how many people are spending money on their college sports team that has no chance of winning anything this year or their NFL team. We care about belonging. We spend billions of dollars every year to belong yep. to things that aren't even awesome. Cleveland Brown fans, I am talking to you. Uh, <laughs> God bless. Go Ducks. Okay, that's all I can say. Go Ducks. <laughs> and they are awesome. <laughs> I would never so, say otherwise, although I remember your, when they weren't. <laughs> give your people something good to belong to. Make yeah, it that's cool right. to be a part of the team that you're a part of and yeah. protect them from the jerks. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, okay, here we go. You're working yeah. harder than ever. There's two more. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. you're working hard. You know these. You wrote yes. them. You're working harder than ever. Still can't keep up. So you're drowning. Yeah. I think you talked about this a little bit. Yeah, before. you're managing by touch. You yeah. are trying to do too much, and you're for 
you've probably hired really expensive minions. You give them tasks instead of responsibilities, right? You're not looking for people to own the responsibility for X in your business. You still think you've got to do that. And so it's not, I hate this phrase like, oh, you should just trust your people. Like we tell this like, oh, it's simple, right? Well, like just trust your people, Ooh. baloney. I don't trust anybody ever for any reason, right? You should manage your people. You should pay attention. You should make sure they're supported. You should create a structure that allows you to track and manage the results that they're producing. You should ask them how they're gonna produce those. You should provide support, guidance, training. So it's not as simple as just trust your people and let go. Like, what a silly thing. I've, I've spent my blood, sweat, and tears for 20 years in a business, and you want me to just suddenly become a moron who doesn't pay attention? That's probably right. not going to work. Yeah. But the level of control, the way you're exercising it, you need some levers in there where you can be there for key decision points and key feedback loops to make sure you're getting the result, but without you having to do it. It's another platitude that got bastardized, though. I mean, the tr yes, you should trust people. You should build mutual trust with the people that are performing. Yeah. But we know all the research shows there's just another another study just came out that said the top thing people want in the workplace is clarity about what they're supposed to be doing. Isn't that insane? <laughs> like like I mean, that's the thing we're missing. Like is just making sure we're on the same page about what well, your job so foundational. actually is. It's so, how do yeah. I, how do I rate myself? How do I know to feel good about what I'm doing if I'm not tied into a purpose and specific things? And no, you know, none of us like to be judged on a moving target either. Like the, the or boss. Or an invisible that, one, the mystery invisible, target, the yeah. double secret probation job. Like you should have you don't known. even know what it is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah it's basic stuff. People okay, last one on your on your amazing list. I think these are yeah. just so so solid. Thank you. You're spending too much time firefighting. Everybody has to fight fires, right? The missing piece is when you spend all your time firefighting, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? And it's it's hard for business owners because in the beginning you you get so rewarded for fighting fires right and it's a lot of us that are at the top of an organizational chart let's just be honest we're kind of adrenaline junkies we like things to move fast we get bored easily i, I was talking with another consultant she called me and said hey what's you know this is the problem i'm having with this person and this on the ceo and i can't get him to blah 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 and she, this consultant is very structured. That's why you hire her is to build that for you. But I said, so let me guess, this guy's been in the field most of his life in his little $15 million construction company. And you came in and told him to sit in the office and do these 27 tasks and his head exploded. And now he won't go back in the office. And she's like, yeah, pretty much. I go, sister, you work with Han Solo. Han Solo is not interested in the Encyclopedia Britannica of rules. No. or a huge task list. Han Solo wants a target and a gun. And I know that because I'm just like him, yeah. right? I don't need to know. I'm, I say to my friend, she plays, I'm like, I'm not a chess player. I'm a paintballer. Give me a <laughs> gun and a target. And let's do this, right? And so it, it's it's useful to remember that we're, we like that. We like the fast pace. We like the challenge. We like the mm -hmm. change. But the bigger your organization gets, you're not a speedboat anymore. Now you're a naval carrier and yeah. you need people. It's okay that the person that invents the heart valve is not the same person that runs the manufacturing plant that produces it. So Absolutely. if you're spending too much time firefighting, A, you probably like it and you're not therefore doing the proactive work of, okay, what's the planning? What's the hiring? How, where do I need to train someone so they can do this instead of me just running around fighting fires in my fiefdom? And the other thing, and nobody talks about this one, but you also have to rein in your fire starting. Absolutely. So, right? I was going to say, because the we how you got to ask yourself the question. I don't mean to hijack this part, but I think it's really important. We do things for a payoff. Even no matter how high up you are or how low down you are, we all need a feedback loop that tells us we're doing we're doing a good job. So if I'm firefighting, I get to go out and feel good about my self-worth, even though I'm the CEO. Look what I the, accomplished. Yeah. I saved you, the day. You get that instant hit. It's dopamine. It's just. Yes. And so letting go of that comfort that firefighting gives you. And we will, we will want it so much that we're willing to start the fires that we get to put out because we really need to feel that rush. Am I wrong? 
Well, I think we do some of that kind of firefighting. I think part of it is that the fires are, um, listen, the higher up you go in leadership, the bigger your enterprise is, the more complex and hard your, your problems are. And they are not easy to solve and they are not easy to think about. And because we tend to be more high energy, action oriented people, if you say to me, do you wanna just go solve this problem right now that you know how to solve, that you can be rewarded for solving and feel good for solving? Or do you wanna sit in a conference room and talk about problems that actually don't have a solution and you're gonna invent one that you're gonna go with because you need one, but you always know right. that it's fraught with danger. And I mean, it's a problem, but right. I actually would take it a step further. And I would say there are times when, you know, you're in a big meeting with everybody and your fire starting when you get this great new idea. So you throw the idea at the team but you never reorganize the other priorities that they have. You never take anything off the plate. You don't provide any additional resources or you're in a meeting, you have the great idea, you do all of those things right, but then you don't give them enough detail to actually complete the task. And you right. never go back and check in with them. Now you're just starting fires. What you've done is plant a fire three weeks from now when you're mad because the thing didn't get done or didn't get done the way you needed it to, but you mm -hmm. didn't actually set it up so that it could. <laughs> yeah, right. And it's and, yeah, it's a hard job all the way around, right? It is, it is. But I really feel like we either, you know, we do too much micromanaging, right? We hold on too tight, we operate on top of people but nobody ever talks about, we also do a thing I would call good luck management, where mm -hmm. I say to you, Matt, you got this, right? Okay, good luck. Call me if you need anything. Call me if you need anything, yeah. <laughs> and we call it freedom and empowerment or whatever, but I don't right. provide you with support or accountability. Right. And usually I don't provide you with enough details to know what you gotta do, and I change your priorities every three days anyway. Mm -hmm. In the middle is what I would call active management. Mm -hmm. And that's where I know what you're up to. We both know what the game is, right? We're both clear what you're here to produce. I know what your plan is for how you're going to produce it. And then my job is to provide support and accountability to make sure that we get all the way across the finish line. And so it's and different. And I was just, this would come up. And I've nurtured yeah. the kind of relationship with you where you will come to me. My yeah. door is actually open. You will come to me proactively at the beginning of a problem and include me in it without fear of, yeah, without fear of uh, me, you know, punishing you for that. Yeah, and I've uh, actually been a decent human when you've done that in the past. Exactly. So now you're, and I just want to say, like, because it's easy for us to get kind of on our pedestal about all the things we got. Very true. And, you know. I am committed to working with my own team that way, right? I, I teach this stuff to other people and I caught myself a few weeks ago. I was answering all the questions and leading all the meetings and, and I was like, what am I doing? I know better than this, right? And I, yeah. listen, I'm very clear that the people on my team are brilliant and I, and I don't want to, I run all the meetings. I don't need to run another meeting for my ego. And so it was funny, I just caught myself in mid stride and I, I was like, oh, you guys, I'm so sorry. Because <laughs> so I think part of it is we get yeah. used to running all the stuff and then we run all the stuff. So I, I just wanted to share that as a way to say it's easy when you're not in the middle of it, right? Like a lot of people know what fight they're going to have with their spouse and you can see it coming. And you know, when I say these five things, my partner is going to say these five <laughs> things and we're going to go and you still can't stop it, right? Yeah. So it's, it's an easy thing to talk about, but a hard thing to execute. And yep. I, I do have a lot of compassion for that, but it's it's fun to get on a high horse and be like, oh my God, I can't believe you're yeah. doing this. And also I can't believe I just did this. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's, it's important to recognize that we're all in this and um, it's a moving target. To, I mean, yeah. the ground is always shifting. Learning and growth requires realizing that nothing is ever staying the same ever. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that means none of us, and it's so much easier to see it in someone else, which is why we all need help. I need <laughs> outside help to help me see what yep. what's going on with me. And we can bring certain things and perspective and methods and tools to others uh, to help them not only see what's going on and, and, but also expand their view of what is possible if they yeah. make certain decisions. Yeah. And at the end of the day, it's that thing where when you accomplish something together with your team that you weren't sure could be accomplished at all, that's a magical moment. I had one of those, my very first summer selling books, we broke a 30 year company record 
We had extraordinary production. It was this magical experience. It, it was all that synergy, like mm-hmm. where, where what we can do together is more than what any of us can do on our own. And, and human beings, we crave that. It's why we watch the Olympics, right? Like it's totally. every good thing about being part of a community and not just being part of it, but being part of a challenge and who you have to become to accomplish what you become is the real gem of it all. Getting to do it together is just this magical thing. And I've seen teams do that. I've, I had yeah. a leader stand up at one of our retreats and start almost crying. This is a manufacturing company, a bunch of old white guys, <laughs> like managers, grumbly, cranky <laughs> sons of guns. And he, he just was so blown away by their contribution to what his grandfather had started and he himself had built. When you get a chance to do that, man, it is hard to get these things right. And it is hard to do a whole bunch of them right enough that you can actually have the magic. But wow, when if you don't get a chance to do that before you kind of, you know, kick the bucket, that's a mistake because it's yeah. such a really extraordinary thing to be part of. Yeah. Wow. Well, I am absolutely, there's just so much, uh, what a buffet of uh, information (laughs) and experience today. Um, And of course we could go on for a lot longer. Um, But uh, what what do you want to leave people with as far as what they can do right now to to do a little better with their leadership team? What's something that that you want to share? I think... um be honest with yourself about what you're not dealing with. When, when our job as leaders is to guard dog the environment, sometimes we are the only one who can take action on certain things. And um, so just sit down and ask yourself, what have I been putting off? What have I been hoping about, right? Like hope is a form of neglect. Hope is not a plan. Hope is not getting anybody any better at anything. It's, it's, you know, it's a, it's a pass that you gave yourself. So what is it you've been ignoring? What is it you've been stepping over? Who do you need to have a conversation with? Maybe you go do that today. And let me just, by the way, put in a little plug here because I'm really in love with the tool and the work that you do with organizations that um, non-anonymous feedback. Mm. Like I work with teams, high performing teams know how to talk to each other. They know how to tell the truth. And a lot of managers are afraid to get that feedback, partly because that hasn't been handled well in the past. And I just, I think it's such a miraculous cheat, if you will, like you could just call somebody and get the secret codes, right? Like you could just have somebody lay out for you and help your organization learn that very challenging skill because there's a format that lets them do it. And I, I'm such a big fan of that because Thank you. It's a technique that's so subtle and layered, but it really helps everybody build up their skills and be a little braver, but do it in a responsible way. So I'm, I'm, you know, that's part of why I liked you, right? I was like, Ooh, this is so smart. <laughs> it's hard. All the human beings are tricky and weird yeah, and inconsistent yeah. and they're worse in groups. Like it's oh, hard. Yeah. Oh, it's all kinds of craziness. <laughs> You know, it's funny because behaviors really cut through. And when you have a model that is a full spectrum of positive behaviors mm-hmm. that, you know, it just helps people gra- ground in behavior because we're all walking around thinking and interpreting and judging based on our perception around values. And mm-hmm. what what we're not as aware of is ha- the behavioral formula that we have attached to those values. So when we say, well, Alicia wasn't very respectful in that meeting. Yes. That actually doesn't mean anything to another person. Yeah. It, it only means something to me, which means I interpreted Alicia's behaviors this way. Yes. Someone else looks at Alicia and goes, no, she was straightforward and, and no nonsense, which is exactly what we needed to be in that. And it's like, oh, OK. So, you know, helping people cut through all of the judgment and the perceptions and the and, and get to a really direct, positive, open dialogue. Well, I mean, and, you're just and I'll not just gonna... add one more thing, like management is a really hard job and we don't train anybody for it we have no common language for developing leaders we don't that's agree right. on a common skill set partly because it is so nuanced so yes. that's also i will say as a just shameless plug for matt stone you guys um <laughs> and he's not even paying me for this but What's because going on? I, we all need really good tools and what I loved when you were sh- walking me through all that is it, it demystifies it, right? It's so practical and so right in the moment. It is, um, I worked with um, this amazing human being. It's a, he's the chief justice for the state Supreme Court of Kentucky. 
Justice Minton, Chief Justice Minton. And he, we were working on some uh, treatment court problems and I'm lucky to be with the Centers for Court Innovation and get to tag team in on some of those and help out there. But um, he said he grew up in Kentucky and he talked about there are some things that you can only deal with at the face of the coal. Like if you're in a coal mine right there at the face where they shear it off. And I feel like your tool is one of those that's at the face of the coal, right? It's right there where the practical thing right. is needed. And in, in my world, I don't really, like, I just, I don't have a lot of tolerance for cliched advice. Like people don't know how much you care until they care or know how much you Blah, blah, the one about knowing how much you care, right? Yes. Or yes. like lead <laughs> I mean, by example, which is right. all great stuff and very true, but it doesn't, it's not at the yeah. face of the coal. It doesn't yeah. solve my Tuesday morning staff meeting with right. two disgruntled people, one slacker, the new guy, and then the hero person who's just holding it all together for me with a ball of string. Like your stuff is very much, if I'm a new manager or I'm a very experienced manager, it gives me exactly what the breakdown is between me and my people and a useful way for us both to get better. I mean, come on, that's practically cheating in a good way. I'm going to grab that line. It's practically (laughs) cheating. (laughs) But the beauty is, is that when we work with brilliant um, consultants and practitioners like yourself, that you can help identify and also create the conditions that allow that person to get in front of that coal. You know, like it, you don't just go there. You need, there's, <laughs> there's a whole other thing. And so that's why to your earlier point, we all need to be working with each other and finding other like-minded practitioners that we can, you know, refer to work with to, to do our part in it because it's not the whole part, but it's a, it's an important piece of it. So I have just nothing but deep respect for the work you're doing and also the incredible humanness and (laughs) realness, authenticity, whatever that means, another bastardized word, but I think whatever it means, whatever it means, you (laughs) exemplify it in spades. I might take that whole one because I, you you can steal it. You want to show up all the way real, right? And yeah, just the older right. I get, too, we just have less capacity. I just have less capacity for pretending. Yeah, I'm just running out of intolerable. Yeah, it's intolerable. It's absolutely intolerable. But what is very tolerable is spending time with you. So, Alicia Huck, how should people find you? What would be the best path yeah. to learn more about you? Um, you can definitely go to maverickandcompany.com. We have all sorts of crazy good stuff there because I'm a, a creator and I whatever good stuff I find, like you want a list of 100 books, I'll get one for you. Um, but there's all kinds of stuff about how I work with teams. And then a great thing to do is to follow me on LinkedIn because we publish all kinds of good stuff for leaders there. And, um, and you're always really welcome to reach out. Like there will be some people who think, Oh my God, I had somebody reach out to me and he said, I don't know if we're too early to work with you or too late. Like we're at about 10 million and it feels like this, but I don't know if I should have called you last year or I should wait until next year. And now's the perfect time. Um, I'm, I like those conversations, you guys. And if you have an inkling that maybe you should be working with someone like me, you should just call me because I'm more fun than other people who are like me. <laughs> Agreed. But and also, even and your if Myers Briggs letters are, you know. Well, you know, can't be that. But it also, it's just worth having the conversation because sometimes that first conversation can yeah. help you pinpoint, you know, I have a client right now and it took him three tries to get me to work with him. <laughs> he called and said, it's this. And I said, nope, go here. And then he called again and said, what about now? And I'm like, nope, it's still not time. And then he <laughs> called a third time. I was like, I don't know, maybe we'll, st- okay. Yeah, this is the one, this is the one that you hire me for. And he makes fun of me because now we're still back to working on the very first problem. The and he's like, one, see, yeah. you should have worked with me when I told you. So you, you won't get a hard sell, but I, I will be really straight with you about where I think you're at and what will make a difference. Cause I think we owe that to each other. We absolutely do. Absolutely. Alicia, thank you so, so much. I can't this wait. This was to, so fun. <laughs> can't wait to commute to do this again soon and, um, and offline as well. So yeah. uh, I know people are going to get a lot of value out of this conversation. I absolutely know that too, for a fact. So. Thank Thanks you again. for the work that you do and for having me on. I love the conversation. I love the tool. I love your work with people. It's just so damn good. We'll see you again. Bye. Bye. And scene.